from Michelle. No. Sorry. That's okay. At some point across the session or shortly afterwards, we're fine to have a chat about that. Um, and yeah, we just want to make this, um, this event available to as many people as possible. Um, so the last thing I'll say about the project itself is that we do actually have our first publications that have emerged. Um, Cambridge University Press have just brought out two volumes entitled Literature and Medicine, the 18th and 19th century respectively. And we have our two editors of those volumes, Clark Lawler and Professor Andrew Mangum here with us today. Um, and those will be published on the 10th of July. Um, what I've done is put a discount code in the chat. So for anyone just joining, I will update that periodically because CUP have been very nice to us and said they want to get the book out there. And you are some of our most willing readers. So I'll keep doing that. But yes, the book, those two books are coming out very soon. And having seen the preview of them myself, they have some really cool and exciting ideas about the field of literature and medicine, which is only growing exponentially right now. So I'm not going to say anything more research based and I'm going to hand over to our speakers. So in this first round table, we have Clark Lawler, Heather Meek and Daisy Cunningham, who are all going to share ideas with you. Um, we've had a slight change to the running order today. Unfortunately, Lee Weatherall Dixon, whose paper was advertised, has had to withdraw for personal reasons. So is being um, re replaced ever so gallantly by, by Clark and we've shifted around the panels a little bit. But he will duly represent the project as Lee is one of our own team members. So if I can, without further ado, first hand over to Clark Lawler to share a few ideas on the project. Clark. Lovely, yeah. Thanks, Ashley. Uh, um, and, you know, welcome uh, everyone. I'm kind of really delighted to see so many of you here and some old friends and hopefully some new as well. So, uh, so um, thank you very much. I was just saying that uh, the digital life being what it is, I just had a complete power cut in my home. All the alarms went off, all the alarms in the area went off, my computer went off, I had a massive panic, and then, uh, and then it all came back on again, so that was good. Um, so uh, thank you for your patience if we experience any further technical problems uh, that happen. But all I'm gonna do now really, um, and I'm not gonna shamelessly plug our volumes anymore, uh, <laughs> so, uh, thank you for doing that already for us, Ashley. Although we, we have some contributors uh, speaking and in the audience as well. Um, I, will, uh, I will just talk you through the, the, um, the, the, the project in its inception really and, and, and tell you a little bit about it uh, briefly. Um, I'm Lee Standing. I wasn't expecting to particularly do anything apart from lurk supportively today. So, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm pleased in a way to be able to just say, say hi uh, in a different way and, and give you some ideas about the project before uh, our speakers who have prepared talks uh, say something more substantial. But the, these are um, some slides that uh, I used um, in Edinburgh a couple of years ago, and I've tweaked them for this occasion as well, also to introduce the project when we had the uh, uh, ISEX, the International Society for 18th Century Studies. Um, periodization, periodization wise, of course, this is a project which is goes from the kind of late 17th century right into the Romantic period and that, that rather imperialistic concept that Romanticists generally hate, uh, called the long 18th century. So I apologize uh, to all Romanticists everywhere um, for that concept, but you know, you, you can wrestle with that as you like, really. But uh, uh, suffice it to say, I respect <laughs> romanticism as a concept, um, even though we problematize it as well. Um, anyway, so I'm going to be, uh, my university doesn't let us use uh, Zoom because it um, gets bombed apparently. So uh, I'm not, oh, host disabled participant screen sharing, Michelle, <laughs> apparently. Can you enable my screen sharing, please? I know you did it before, so we, we say it's just, it must be the power cut has kind of killed me with that one. You, sh you should be able to now. Right. I don't oh, know. I can. Hooray. Here we go. Okay. Right. So that's uh, sharing away. Brilliant. Um, okay. Right. Um, yeah. So a uh, few things to say about um, the writing doctors. Uh, medical representation and personality circa 1662. Oh, I need to change my view a little bit here. Go down. There we go. Um, uh, 
uh, re mesical representation of personality circa 1660 to 1832. Um, the, it's, it goes wider than that. I'll, 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 it sounds like it's going to be about doctors' personalities, um, specifically male doctors' personalities, and it kind of is, but it's gone a lot wider as well. Um, so uh, the personality part tends to bring up thoughts about uh, medical self-fashioning, doctors representing themselves, uh, um, portraits uh, and visual arts and all that kind of thing, which we do as well, uh, their own writing and selling themselves in their own, uh, their own writing. But um, actually, it's, it's about a lot more than that. So I'll, I'll explain a little bit uh, why uh, and what that might be in a second. Uh, and again, there's the offensive periodization there. So uh, please bear with and be kind. Um, and uh, the rest of it is, uh, thank you, we love the Levy Hume Trust, thank you very much uh, for helping support our publications, uh, including the, the new uh, literature medicine volumes uh, that are just coming out on the 10th of July, I believe. Um, and uh, of course, uh, my own university, Northumbria as well. But, you know, again, with these projects, we want it to be so, about so much more than just one institution and, and it very much is you know we really have tried to bring in people from from all uh, uh, all around the world and also from different points in the academic uh, um, uh, ladder as it were if you want to use that kind of hierarchical concept so we're very keen to encourage uh, uh, junior researchers as well as um, senior ones and middle ones and whatever other sorts there are um, so that's kind of important thing to bear in mind. Um, now, aha, okay, right. Um, so, uh, yes, I'm a, 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 making it move. So the project, yeah, so this is an interesting one, isn't it? The main idea to be tested, it says, is that British culture was changed in a significant number of areas as a consequence of the language of medical expression. Uh, sorry, I'm reading this out, but it's, it just makes more sense if I do. Moving from Latin to English towards the end of the 17th century. That these changes can be traced across many fields of cultural life during the course of the succeeding century. Um, okay, so Latin to English. It sounds a bit kind of simple, doesn't it? It sounds like it's a kind of straightforward move where um, uh, uh, the language of medical expression becomes democratized, but it has a massive number of implications as we, we realize quite rapidly when we're writing the bid document, um, and thank you to Alan Ingram for coming up with that basic idea, by the way, um, uh, of, of where that was. And it, 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 when we, once we got our heads together and started thinking about it, we realized that, that doctors writing in English, and that we started off with, uh, you know, dead white males and moved rapidly kind of away from them um, or, or around them. Um, it lets people write in the vernacular. It massively expands the audience for your medical writing, your writing about other things as well, your creative writing. It allows you to fashion yourself as a medical personality in ways which you couldn't before when you were really writing in Latin and not much else, um, maybe dipping into the vernacular. Um, and we're not saying that the Latin vanished as a mode of, of, of writing for a long time. It didn't, certainly it, it stuck around, but there was that gradual and general shift and uh, very noticeably so at the end of the 17th century. So what that does is it releases this massive energy of print publication, of, 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 uh, of medical creativity in a number of um, directions, which I hadn't frankly thought about much before we started thinking about the project. Um, and that's the, the, you know, sometimes you write the big document and it becomes more, more sort of, uh, advanced than you thought it was ever going to be. Um, so that's the, 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 it was our basic, uh, um, tenet for the project, but it, it quite rapidly mushroomed into lots of other things as well. Um, so again, that, that I, I do see it as a sort of a release of creative energy uh, in the vernacular and, 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 and certainly allowed doctors in the first instance, um, but rapidly moving on to all kinds of other healthcare professionals um, to, uh, to self fashion and of course, when you think about satire as well, be refashioned by other people. Ha -ha. Um, and that, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a sociable thing. It's an interactive thing. So here we go. So yeah, um, we, we are investigating the way in which perception of health practitioners was altered, both from the vantage point of the public and from the individuals and professions themselves. Um, so it, again, it's a social thing, as I was saying, it's, it's, uh, uh, it's a multi-perspectival thing. Um, to, to 
have this possibility of, of communicating in the vernacular um, and with multiple reasons for that. I mean, I'm, I'm at the moment working on, on sort of earlier in the century on, uh, uh, on Sir Richard Blackmore, who is a kind of an odd individual in various ways, but uh, was very, very keen on, on publishing in the vernacular um, and even encouraging, shall, dare I say, women to practice medicine as well. Uh, very surprising given his very straight laced in other ways, um, Christianity. Um, so again, that's, you know, how are all these peripheral in inverted commas healthcare workers going to fit into this equation? How do the general public fit into this? Thirdly, uh, we're considering the powerful effects of writing via the media of literary and visual texts. And obviously um, visual texts are a large part of this in the construction of public awareness of the body, um, especially female and how to maintain health. So along with this, this moving to the vernacular, you get the possibility of teaching people in a better way, uh, theoretically, how to maintain their own health and how to know their own bodies. So this brings about a shift in the perception of the body um, from the layperson as well as the, the uh, specialized medical coterie. Um, so that, the, that your own body can therefore be visualized with more technical terminology sometimes, not always, but sometimes, or uh, metaphors that emanate from the medical profession rather than from the literary one. Although actually we find it's interactive, of course, and you're not surprised to find. Um, so that's uh, an interesting effect as well of the, as I say, these, these powerful energetic effects of the shift into the vernacular and these media of literary and visual texts. And of course, our argument is with many others that literary texts are a form of knowledge in themselves, a medical knowledge in themselves, and help to, uh, to, to create um, medical understandings. And my own work, has been, I've been working on this for years with you, as you, you might know from consumption and how literary texts and visual texts uh, um, in the Romantic period for certain um, create uh, um, an understanding and possibly even an experience of a, a lethal disease. Um, anyway, uh, so that's uh, another uh, couple of questions there. There are more, but I think that gives you a little flavour in the time available of, of, of the kinds of thoughts we, we were starting to have and have been having about the project. Um, here we go. So this is a very motley crew, isn't it? Blimey, look at that lot. Um, that very dodgy person in the middle is me. Um, uh, you can see Ashley. Uh, you can see Alan Ingram, whose idea this project was in the first place, uh, who's lurking in the audience and might pop up and say something. Lawrence, our postgraduate uh, on the project as well. Uh, Lawrence Sullivan, he's also lurking in the audience somewhere and will no doubt say something useful at some point, uh, as he always does. Uh, Helen, who can't be with us today, Helen Williams, um, she's... Uh, uh, um, very good on print culture um, uh, and Stern is her real uh, big thing as well. Um, I should have said that uh, Ashley works um, uh, on midwifery writings uh, and uh, female healthcare writings in general as well. So she's got a, a good uh, uh, um, a good spread of knowledge, which does which is not brought by other members of the team, uh, and we'll hopefully fit in and, and bring our own. Uh, um, our own knowledge to the to the uh, to the, the table. Uh, Lawrence, I should have also said, is working on domestic medicine, uh, female domestic medicine at that, and and literary writings in the 18th century. Um, he's very knowledgeable, he knows much more than I do by now. So uh, do pester him about that sort of thing. Domestic medicine, female uh, midwifery, uh, female, female domestic medicine as well, and male, come to think of it. Um, and there's Lee, who is uh, stricken down uh, by illness, um, poor thing, as we speak and should have been speaking, and is, we would be gutted to miss you because she obviously, as you many of you know, is a romanticist and is working on the novels of, um, am I saying Thomas More? I've got the name right, I've probably got his name wrong. Uh, I've not read them myself, uh, but I do know of them and uh, they, she's mining them for very interesting stuff and uh, lots of medical politics and self fashioning as we speak, um, when she gets better at least anyway. So that's us. Um, and there we are, there's some names, uh, which I've just said really anyway. Oh, there you are, Michelle. There's the team of advisors, including you, Dr. Michelle Fobert, professor, sorry, not associate professor. This has not been updated. Very bad, sorry about that. Um, and many of collaborators. And we really mean that. We want, we want involvement from, from, uh, from around the world. Uh, it's much the better project for it um, if we do have that as well. So if anyone wants to get involved, please do say um right Boing. there we go um yeah this is the dead white males 
list. Um, uh, I'm working on Sir Richard Blackmore at the moment, as I say, but um, everyone, you know, many of you will have worked on some of these people <laughs> at one point or another. Uh, John Polidori, obviously, that's Michelle, um, uh, Keats, that's almost everyone. Um, but, you know, we, we've got writing doctors, we've got writing, uh, um, some are more doctors than writers, some are more writers than doctors, but it is a spectrum um, of creativity um, from early in the period to late in the period. Uh, but all deploy medical knowledge and create medical knowledge in their literary writings as well. Now, OK, dead white meals. That's great. Fine. Um, I nothing, nothing wrong with that, I say. But also uh, the project isn't just about that. Um, it's about midwives, apothecaries, quacks, lay women commentators, physicians, surgeons, nurses and carers, wise women, cunning women, herb women. Um, all these people, some of whom may not be had massive access to literacy, uh, and that's obviously more difficult to work with. Um, but we're interested in all this, the the system of healthcare um, the, that creates medical experience and concepts uh, and writings. Um, so it's a very wide net. Um, in fact, an impossibly wide net for one project to do. So there's always more work to do when we finished. Um, but hopefully this is kickstarting the whole thing, um, or at least, uh, well, not kickstarting, but other people have worked on it, uh, of course, um, and we uh, obviously acknowledge that as well. But hopefully this gives a more comprehensive, wider vision of healthcare, medical writings, who's doing writing, what writing is important, as well as the, the canon um, that we have at present. Um, okay, so yeah, that's I've probably run over time already. Um, but if you want to know more, writingdoctors.info is the uh, the place to go. That's that's got uh, um, stuff on the website, and of course, um, uh, you know the the new volumes that are coming out are sort of a reasonable step in that direction as well. But that's our project website. Um, okay, so if I were to stop sharing this, uh, then I think I can hand back over to Ashley. Thank you very much, Clark. That's an excellent whistle-stop view of everything we've been doing for such a long time in rooms that have not been as full of other people as we would have liked. Um, so as well as the website, please do feel free to quiz Clark, myself and the other project members here today when we get to the Q&A, because there really is so much coming out of this project. The next person I'd like to invite to talk is Heather Meek, who is an excellent supporter of the project and has been a long-standing colleague of uh, literature and medicine teams at Northumbria. Um, Heather, have we got you on screen? Yes, I'm here. <laughs> excellent. Um, thank you, everyone. Um, it's really nice to see you. I, there are many of you who I haven't seen since I think it was 2011 at the Before Depression Conference where I first um, met um, <laughs> the Northumbria crowd. Um, so this is really, this is really lovely. And I'm glad that um, Clark prepared the romanticists and the audience for um, my paper, which is on the long 18th century, more than on the romantics. Um, it's a, this is um, somewhat exploratory. It's new work, so be kind. And I believe my paper is about um, 11 or 12 minutes. Um, so, you just bear with me for this short time. And the title is Hester Thrail Piazzi and Practices of Bloodletting. In October 1771, nearly 150 years after William Harvey's monumental discovery of the circulation of the blood, Hester Lynch Piazzi, then Hester Thrail, in a letter to Samuel Johnson, uses images of the movement, texture, and drawing of human blood to characterize a group of agreeable young folks just come from school somewhere on the continent. There's a bird. Terrible timing. <laughs> I like the bird. <laughs> um, so I'll, perhaps I'll just begin again. 
In October 1771, nearly 150 years after William Harvey's monumental discovery of the circulation of the blood, Hester Lynch Piazzi, then Hester Thrale, in a letter to Samuel Johnson, uses images of the movement, texture, and drawing of human blood to characterize a group of agreeable young folks just come from school somewhere on the continent. She explains that these young men are going to London for the first time with clear complexions and hearts apparently as clear and remarks how soon they would be altered. She continues, a capital city will by even a short residence in it change the whole mass. How florid, bright and transparent is the arterial blood before it has passed through, through the heart, metropolis of our human fr frame and how muddy, gross and heavy in comparison is that which we draw from the veins in its return. But I must say no more. You would rather be sick in London, I remember, than well in the country. As I will explain in more detail shortly, in this passage, Piazzi, like many medical authorities of the 17th and 18th centuries, including the great Harvey himself, relies on understandings of blood that are at once symbolic and scientific, humoral and mechanical. An examination of the practice and representation of bloodletting in particular in the autobiographical writings of Piazzi and in contemporaneous medical treatises brings us into a multifaceted pre-professionalized medical world enmeshed in understandings of the body that relied as much on enigma and contradiction as they did on rationality and empiricism. Bloodletting as it is represented in these texts elucidates the productive tension and dynamic commotion of medical voices and ideas in this period. In the above passage, Piazzi, who like many learned women of her time, read and interpreted with a keen eye medical literature, reproduces Harvey's model of blood circulation as she describes blood moving out of the heart through the arteries and back into the heart through the veins. Her suggestion that the blood contained in the arteries is more salubrious reflects Harvey's notion that blood, having passed through the heart and lungs, leaves the left ventricle, leaves the left ventricle oxygenated. Arterial blood is indeed, as she notes, more florid and bright than its venous counterpart, which is comparatively muddy red. Piazzi's alignment of the forward movement of travelers and blood circulation is reminiscent of Harvey's <clears throat> claim that blood circulated continually and in one direction, rather than following older models, ebbing and flow flowing, pooling in the extremities, moving indiscriminately through the so-called pores of the body, rolling back and forth between the left and right sides of the heart and traversing arteries and veins. Piazzi's metaphorical association of the heart with a relatively enervating London resists a depiction of the heart as supreme bodily force and ultimate source of life, following what some scholars have seen, rightly or wrongly, as Harvey's dethronement of the heart. Complementing this seemingly modern systematic view of circulation is Piazzi's formulation of a process determined by enduring humoral ideas. Her description of the heart as metropolis of our human frame and her final evocation of Johnson's elevation of London hints at a hierarchical vision of the body in which the heart has not in fact been unambiguously dethroned. While she characterizes arterial blood according to its brighter, redder hue, she sees venous blood as different, not only in color, but also in consistency. It is gross and heavy. Her description thus recalls the Galenic view that venous blood was generated from food that had been transformed in the liver. It was fundamentally different because it lacked the vitality of arterial blood, which had passed through the heart and been infused with so-called vital spirits. Piazzi's metonymic use of blood to represent the state of being of each of the young travelers she, she describes implies that she somehow endorsed the lingering notion that one's essence was contained in the blood a position reinforced in her larger work in which, for instance, she frequently attrib attributes her own passionate, impetuous tendencies to her Welsh blood. While Harvey himself insisted in the face of many objections that the same blood moved through arteries and veins, he declared that blood and spirit mean one and the same thing. According to Gail Kern Pastor, 
spirit in Harvey's formulation retains its privilege as that which confers identity, integrity, and value on otherwise dead matter. Blood without the spirit of life was spoiled. The weighty symbolic and scientific meanings of blood as a crucial determinant of the self, as a source of both animation and evil, as a waste product, and as a humor that could throw off one's constitutional balance, sometimes fatally, might partially explain why so many 18th century individuals assumed that it often needed to be expelled from the body. When Piazzi refers casually to the blood we draw from the veins, implicit in her phrasing is the notion that phlebotomy is simply something that is routinely done. A reading of a range of 18th century medical treatises attests to the robustness of bloodletting as a standard practice. Thomas Sydenham, known as the English Hippocrates, claimed to put his trust in nature as cure and frequently prescribed the necessity of drawing blood from veins. In his 1725 treatise on mental affliction, Richard Blackmore, who Clark mentioned earlier, describing the body as porous and suggesting that disease was lodged in the blood announces that madness can be removed when a vein is speedily opened. In his 1729 work, the physician writer Nicholas Robinson provides a prescription reminiscent of the Grecian method of removing blood adjacent to the source of infection when he writes that leeches should be applied to the veins as near the parts affected as possible. Like many other doctors into the late century, Robinson used leeches as well as the trusty lancet, spring-loaded fleam, and sometimes cupping with scarification, which involved the use of heat, blistering, and a spring-loaded box with 12 to 18 blades. William Buchan, in his immensely popular domestic medicine, which first appeared in 1772, prescribed bleeding for almost every distemper imaginable, including, rather surprisingly, conditions that came with the involuntary discharge of blood, such as the bloody flux, blood in the urine, the spitting of blood, and miscarriage. <clears throat> there were, however, some objections to the practice, as you see in much of the literature of the period. In his 1749, a remonstrance against the, mis the mischievous abuse of phlebotomy, surgeon Thomas Godman denounces those whom he calls bungling interlopers and rash and ignorant pretenders, whose lack of skill in undertaking this hazardous operation has led to the loss of limbs, the puncturing of arteries and tendons, and innumerable deaths. He certainly would have disapproved of William's William Buchan's suggestion that he who can pull a tooth can also draw blood, or Samuel Johnson's decision after having had 12 ounces of blood removed by a surgeon in the afternoon to take it upon himself to open the orifice and let out 10 ounces more that night. To some degree, Piazzi would have agreed with Godman's cautious approach. She recognized, for instance, the harm blood letters could do as when she mentions an acquaintance whose present pleasures and enjoyment have been deferred due to the accident of injuring an artery and letting blood. Piazzi's work also reveals that she thought bloodletting could cure illness or at the very least bring some form of relief. Even by 18th century standards, she experienced atrocious suffering, losing several infants and young children and watching two husbands die. As she repeatedly beheld the inevitable approach of death, the administration of bloodletting seems to have allowed her to believe that practitioners were taking measures to save her family members, or at the very least offer them comfort in their final moments. When one of her daughters, four-year-old Lucy, described repeatedly as one of her favorites, experienced a spiking fever and approached her end, the doctors bled her with leeches, which, as Piazzi writes, rose the girl temporarily before she expired. Piazzi's last memory of her first husband, Thrail, involves the doctors cutting his clothes off to bleed him. Piazzi herself, in the wake of Thrail's death, experienced what she called tortures and found relief in phlebotomy. By her account, she was bled six times in six months. Piazzi, of course, lived in an age before antibiotics, anesthetics, effective painkillers, and antiseptic precautions and treatments. Horrible suffering and death could thus often not be curbed. 
Medical treatments had not caught up in sophistication to theories like Harvey's. An enduring belief in the efficacy of bloodletting was perhaps of crucial emotional importance to patients like Piazzi, who needed to believe that something was to be done to alleviate their difficulties. <clears throat> in this way, bloodletting might, blood might be understood, however strange this may sound to us, as a form of 18th century psychological therapy, one which paradoxically came with, the possible, per with possible perils to physical health. Overall, Piazzi's writings, much like Johnson's, show a simultaneous welcoming, contesting, and enthusiastic seeking out of phlebotomists in a way that reflects the larger tensions around this practice and the freedom many lay people, including women, felt in making claims to medical authority. Bloodletting might be understood as a practice that embodies the spirited competing perspectives of 18th century medical literary discourse, one in which humoral models and emerging empirical theories and prevailing ideologies and voices of dissent coexisted uncomfortably yet fruitfully alongside each other in ways that make this period so marvelous and instructive to us. In this sense, grounding ourselves firmly in the 18th century, the question of whether phlebotomy was, in Godman's words, a mischievous abuse, or in the opinion of one of his physician contemporaries, a true and solid cure should be opened up and explored rather than answered with certainty. Thank you. Thank you so much. That was not, <laughs> I realized reading that, that, that last sentence, I'm not endorsing the practice of bloodletting. <laughs> not a, <laughs> I just, I think it's interesting to think about, you know, the, you know, grounding ourselves in the, in the 18th century and thinking about how these people experienced the actual practice of bloodletting and Piazzi's works really speak to us in that respect. And I would have liked to talk about gender too and Gail Kern Pastor in particular, I, I didn't have time to do everything obviously, but she talks about bloodletting in relation to women in particular. And her, her work applies more to the, to the 17th century and earlier um, and she looks at the ways that women's bodies were, she, I think she calls them leaky and unruly in the ways they were represented. Um, so, and she contrasts this to the practice of bloodletting as this regulated, disciplined practice um, that, that brings women, <laughs> you know, that brings them back into order out of the chaos <laughs> that their bodies represent. So that's, I mean, that's something else that I would, that I'd really like like to explore and then to think also about what that means for women blood letters in the 18th century because I, I don't know much about about how much women practice bloodletting um, <laughs> but if they did that 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 is another interesting element um, in this in this um, exploration of women and bloodletting and their relationship to the more conventional discourses found in the medical treatises of the time. So I will end there <laughs> and I'll, I'll hand it back to Ashley. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Heather. Um, Hester Thrill Piazzi and Practices of Bloodletting has opened up uh, so many ideas to me and I've got lots of words here written down that might at one time have been considered oppositional and now I'm thinking, is there a more complicated picture to the way we think about bloodletting and some of those really fundamental practices that were so accepted? Um, You've got both Clark and Sharon talking about contemporary uses of bloodletting. Uh, I didn't know it was still used, but um, I'm wondering now if one of the outputs of our project, Clark, should be to test that out if you're volunteering. Um, but I've got lots I'd like to ask Heather before you do. <laughs> I thought you might say no. Um, so if I could pass to Daisy Cunningham next, um, before I think everybody bursts with questions already. Yes, um, hello, hang on, I will do the screen sharing thing. Um, is that looking all right to everyone? Fantastic. 
Um, so, uh, so yes, hello, I'm Daisy Cunningham. I'm the Heritage Manager at the Royal College of Physicians of Edinburgh. Um, I completed my PhD last year um, and I was particularly doing a lot of research in Newcastle on the Newcastle dispensary and was completely unaware of just around the corner, Clark and everyone else doing their fantastic research. So it's, it's, it's better late than never for me to find out um, what else is going on. But what I was going to particularly talk about today is the Edinburgh dispensary um, and looking at the way in which diagnosis and cure is displayed in the printed sort of public material and compare that with the patient case notes and just see perhaps or get some initial thoughts on what physicians were trying to achieve when they were talking about their patients in a particular way. Um, so I will do that incredible quick um, contextualization of, of what I'm talking about and what I'm trying to achieve. So the history of uh, studying or the historiography of charitable medicine really has a big shift um, with Nicholas Dewson and his theories on the divide between bedside medicine and the shift to hospital medicine. And this is particularly the idea of the changing power balance between, you know, the wealthy patient who was being treated in their own home and the charitable patient who was being treated in an infirmary. And a lot of what comes later and the examples I've put up here have really focused in particularly on this notion of, you know, the changing power balance, which is displayed through the language used when treating patients, uh, sort of the level of control that they have or the level in which their voice is heard in the diagnostic encounter. Um, more recent works, just a quick examples here. Um, what I think is particularly relevant, these all these works are obviously um, really fascinating and really look at medical institutions in a much broader sense, looking at communities, looking at networks and relationships. But the overwhelming focus really has been on residential institutions, which by their nature have a greater level of, say, control over their patients than an outpatient facility. And that's the sort of aspect that I'm really interested in is there's one way of looking at residential institutions which control to, to a large extent, not entirely people's diet when they go to bed, where they sleep, and the outpatient dispensary clinics, which have a very different relationship with their patients and a very different role for the patient voice um, within that conversation. So that's just to give a little of um, context to what I'm trying to do. This is the Edinburgh dispensary. Um, it was established in 1776, and it was part of the dispensary movement that was taking place at that time. So there were 38 dispensaries established across Britain in various towns and cities by 1800. Um, and just to, again, explain it just a little bit, dispensaries were generally outpatient clinics. Sometimes they did visit patients in their own homes, but usually the patients were expected to come to them. They were generally free. By contrast to infirmaries, they were cheaper to run, um, and because they were non-residential, patients could continue their lives to a greater extent, so they could continue providing for their families, you know, continue employment. Um, and so they do provide a different type of insight. They don't take people out of their living situations, they treat them within their kind of existing context. Another big difference between dispensaries and infirmaries is that dispensaries were much more commonly founded and managed by the physicians themselves. So rather than lay people making decisions over who could be admitted, how the money was managed, things like that, it was done by the actual physicians. Um, so I will just, ah, here we go. Um, so this is the founder of the Edinburgh dispensary, Andrew Duncan. Um, often dispensaries were founded by a single individual um, and not always for entirely altruistic reasons. So Andrew Duncan had previously worked at Edinburgh University as a professor. He had um, worked at the Royal Infirmary. He lost that role, um, not really through any fault of his own, essentially through nepotism. Um, the son of the guy who previously had the job took over the job and Andrew Duncan was turfed out. And so really he set up the dispensary, you know, it, it, to an element of philanthropy, but, but really in large part so that he could continue teaching students and he could continue his research. So he was trying to learn from his patients, um, which again was not uncommon with physician, dispensary physicians in this period. Um, so 
in terms of what to get into the kind of nitty gritty of what I, I want to talk about. Um, there are a wide range, of course, of archival sources, but this is probably the most significant one, which is, as far as I know, these are the only case notes for any 18th century dispensary that exist. Um, so rather than being reliant purely on published material, we have these incredibly detailed, there's 5,000 individual, well, over 5,000 individual patient case notes. Each case note is about eight to 10 pages long. So there's a lot of detail about each individual patient. Um, and it's a very good opportunity, as I say, to compare these case notes with, with the published face of the dispensary. So this is one of the annual reports of the dispensary. Um, for whatever reason, probably partially because initially there weren't a lot of patients, these annual reports are very useful because they literally list every single patient and what their outcome is. So they're not just numbers we know their names. So we can compare what it says here about Robert Hamilton with what it says in the handwritten notes about Robert Hamilton, um, for example. So I went for a kind of lurid colors. I hope nobody minds. Um, these are the, the outcomes for two years of annual reports. So this is what the annual reports say was happening with those patients. So, you know, quite a lot of these are self-explanatory. Definitely dead is pretty self-explanatory. Treatment continued means there was no outcome because the patient stayed on the books until the next year. And there are statistics for patient outcomes provided by a lot of infirmaries and dispensaries in their annual reports. And it's something historians have really grappled with to try and understand what these sort of raw you know, numbers actually meant in reality. Um, and what are we not seeing when we are presented with these kind of numbers? So the first thing that is entirely missing is the very large percentage of patients who just quit attending and didn't say why, um, and we don't know the outcome for. That was very, very common. Almost half of patients just stopped receiving treatment before they were cured or, or, or dead or um, what have you. And comparing the names, it's clear that anyone who didn't attend again was classed as cured by default. So about a third of patients never turned up. We don't know what happened, but the annual report says that all those patients were cured. Now, of course, there's a whole range of reasons why you might not turn up again. You might be dead. You might not like the treatment that you were getting um, and probably a myriad of other reasons. So to assume that they were cured definitely gives a particular impression to the public about how successful this institution is, um, which might not necessarily be reflected by um, reality. So, um, and this is very whistle stop. There's a lot more I could say, but I'll, I'll keep going to kind of, to try and stick to my, my time limit. Um, the other published source that I've been looking at are a selection of medical cases from the dispensary that were published, as you can see here, in a, in a kind of collected volume. Um, and looking at the dates that this covers, there are 26 medical cases in this volume. And in the same period, there are 90 individual cases in the handwritten notes. So of course, there's quite a lot of information that this doesn't contain. Um, now, there's no reason to assume that this was done through any malicious intention. Of course, it can't be absolutely comprehensive. Um, these are a list of the diseases which are covered in the printed case notes. Um, and of course, they're trying to include essentially one of each type of disease. So they wouldn't want to repeat the same disease over and over again. So they're selecting individual cases um, that they feel would be scientifically useful. Another sort of more of a kind of conscious manipulation, I suppose, is that the case notes are weighed in favor of those people who did stay long enough to have an outcome. Again, of course you would logically do that, but it might give the impression that more people are staying and more people are having a positive outcome of the treatment than is actually the case. But what might be even more significant are the diseases that are not represented here at all. So in the case that the handwritten notes from this period, there are seven cases of hysteria. And yet hysteria doesn't get a mention in the printed case notes at all, which I think is quite interesting. Um, there is no, th I can never say this word, thesis, thysis, um, in the print version, there are 13 cases in the handwritten notes. So again, there has been a choice made to not include those conditions. The other um, sort of significant exclusion is abortion. There are five cases um, in, the, in the handwritten notes in this period that are specifically concerned with abortion, 
that does not get a mention in the printed case notes. So in some cases, it feels like it's not just to do with keeping the case notes sort of neat and tight and orderly. There's also levels of omission that might be more broadly significant. Ooh, sorry, I'm trying. Ah, here we go. Um, so this is another significant factor. This um, excerpt from the case note says, regarding disease of this patient, must own at first was and still am very much at a loss. So what doesn't come out in the printed material is how often they don't have the faintest idea what's going on. Funnily enough, they didn't publish those case notes, but there was a huge percentage. This particular case, uh, John Seaton, he had difficulty discharging urine, he had eye pain, a rash and a headache. So all these sort of symptoms that seem to be very unconnected and they just couldn't figure out what was wrong with them. But they don't include cases like that because they don't appear decisive enough. Um, oh. I'll go back one. Um, this is a picture of an intestinal worm because a lot of my life for the last four years is spent reading about intestinal worms because it's, it's very common with poor patients that when they go to the doctor, they are not going to the doctor with a disease. They're going to the doctor with a myriad of diseases. So they might be going there for a fever, but they may also have had intestinal worms for three years and they may have not menstruated for two years. So it is not a single complaint. Most people, it is a collection of different diseases, which in the print version, they, they don't want to deal with that complexity. They want it to be one disease which is treated and cured. Um, and I think particularly talking about poorer patients, it is incredibly common for people to have conditions that relate to malnourishment and poverty in, in various ways. So in the title, I put, um, imprudent and deceitful, and that's kind of the last thing I really want to touch on here. Uh, and this is a very notable omission from the publicity material, annual reports and printed case notes. And perhaps it is to do with, as I was saying before, the level of control that the physician has in, in the um, medical encounter is actually relatively low in dispensaries by contrast to infirmaries. Um, patients can just stop attending whatever they want. They don't need to be discharged. and doctors don't know what patients are doing when they're not there for treatment. So they don't know what they are doing in their normal day-to-day -day lives, what they are eating, what other medicines they are taking. Um, and it's very difficult to tell when they are telling lies. Um, and this is particularly a concern with dispensaries because a big part of the selling point of dispensaries is people won't cheat like they might do in an infirmary. Why would they? You don't get food, you don't get a bed to sleep in. Why would you lie? And the most common um, sort of instances in which that is questioned is when they believe that women are pregnant and they are trying to get an abortion. So they are lying about what their medical complaint is in order to get medicine that would carry, you know, would perform um, as an abortion. Um, so this is one of the medicines, Jalop, that is frequently prescribed. Um, that they do not want to give to, to women if they think they might be pregnant through concern that it could bring about an abortion. Um, and as I say, a huge percentage of the women have sort of menstruation related complaints in part probably because of their, their diet and so on. So it can be very difficult to tell when this is actually the case. Um, uh, so this is one of many examples from the case notes um, they are trying to get a medicine to restore menses, which will be means of procuring abortion. Um, and this is something that weighed hugely on the minds of physicians. Almost every case involving a woman, it almost doesn't seem to matter what the disease is. They will question whether she might be trying to get something that, that will, uh, you know, procure menstruation, will, will, um, will carry out an abortion. And yet it is omitted from the public face of this institution. And we have to bear in mind that they are very reliant on donors. They are very reliant on the public approving of the work that the dispensary does. So there may be a level of conscious thought in omitting the idea that it is quite possible that the patients are lying and trying to get medicine, um, uh, whatever the word is, in full, under false pretenses. That's what I was trying to say. Mm -hmm. um, so just to, just to finish up, um, I think, as I was saying, some of the changes, some of the differences are purely down to practical reasons of the need for brevity, the need to have a clear disease for a case study. But some of these omitting mention of the fact that so many patients cease attending and they have no idea how the treatment worked. Um, and particularly in cases of sort of 
large instances um, which are omitted perhaps does show a, a conscious manipulation of that information. And I think what it also does, it means if we rely you know, solely on the printed records, then we get a, a distorted idea of what is actually happening in these people's lives because the printed records portray the diseases that are considered to be most interesting, perhaps most dramatic, most likely to be fatal. And the huge amount of un underlying sort of low level conditions like intestinal worms, gynecological problems, are underrepresented in those resources. Um, and that's me, thank you. As with Heather, there's a million and one more things I could have said, but um, we got the basics, I think. Daisy, thank you so much. Impertent and deceitful physicians discussing their charitable patients in private and print has made me think so very diff differently about how everybody discusses medicine in all types of ways and much like Heather's paper I'm thinking in terms of oppositions lies and truth and, and and what the reality is in between that so I think you've also stimulated some fantastic discussion so it would be at this point that in person I would bring all of our speakers together at the front of a room um, to answer some questions so I'm got you all on the side of my screen now um, and I'm going to turn to the chat first um, if that's all right uh, because we've already had some questions coming in for the three of you before I do so I'm going to ask Bryn to uh, she's got a hand raised um, do you want to start the questions Oh, sure. Yeah, I'd love to. That was just uh, mind boggling. I took so many notes that I can't read now. Uh, and it's just so, so amazing. And also, I guess, unsurprising how connected everything is like everything uh, Daisy talks about is connected to what um, what makes been talking about. And then it's just, it's just so beautiful. But what I was really interested in was when you're talking about Piazza and uh, bloodletting, the idea of it being infused with vital spirits or soul or consciousness um, and that which confers identity and value. Um, so is there a lot on that sort of idea of spirit or what we like consciousness, what we call today or subjective experience um, and how that sort of um, defines identity? Does that come in at all? Um, I. I think that a lot of the work that's been done on that is sort of rooted in in the like before the 18th century. And I mentioned Gail Kern Pastor, who writes um, so eloquently and completely on this topic. And it is somewhat out of my <laughs> area of expertise in some ways. But I would say that I, you know, the the notion of you know the 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 vital spirit of the blood, I think, endures into the 18th century and. You know the preoccupation with the those those subtle essences, the animal spirits, which are mentioned in so many different medical texts. So I think there are, there is this sort of elusive quality um, attached to the body that 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 lingers into the into the 18th century. And and in terms of the, like the blood <laughs> blood representing in some ways essence. Um, you know, Gail Kern Pastor talks a lot about the, the symbolic and lexical weight of blood and all of the different all of the different things that it is connected to. And one of those I think is spirit and identity. So I, I haven't thought this through fully, but I think it's interesting to think about that in relation to bloodletting. So if you have, you know, Piazzi talks about the importance of of getting rid of the gross and muddy blood in the veins and, and just keeping the, the vital salubrious <laughs> blood, um, which I think is connected to, to spirit. So, so to think through how, how bloodletting some, in some ways perhaps allowed people to think about a, as a purifying force in terms of identity <laughs> um, in, in some respect. I, those are kind of scattered thoughts, but, but I think there, there's something to be done there in, in terms of how we understand identity in the 18th century um, and, and, and looking both at sort of a version of the body that is rooted in something more um, mystical and humoral, <laughs> um, but at the same time, you know, f following Harvey um, 
uh, something more precise and mechanical and disciplined. Um, so, so I think the 18th century is, is, is a place where we kind of, like we're bordering, we're on the edge of both of those, those worlds. Um, right, so I'll stop there <laughs> before I start repeating myself. <laughs> That's brilliant, I, yeah, that was just so beautifully put together. So thank you, yeah, you're all amazing. So grateful to be here. I can only agree with that view. Um, and, and that answer, Heather, has very much made me think of Liz's comment in the chat here that um, Chinese acupuncture still uses um, bloodletting, but that it's apparently agonizing. And I'm trying to kind of offset that with the spiritual aspects of the, and I can see the links, but um, yeah, maybe there's a lot to be said about, about the 18th century as an experimental world for our current um, health challenges. Yeah, and in terms of, you know, the, the modern uses of bloodletting, that is an interesting question. And I mean, I think, I don't know too much about that, but I do believe it's used for um, a rare condition in which people have produced too much iron. So they're let blood every three or four months or something. And there's, <laughs> there's, a, there's a kind of a popular book by, I think it's William Starr, who writes about the history of bloodletting. And he turns to the contemporary moment and and talk sort of in a loose way about the feeling that people get after they give blood, um, this kind of feeling of lightness. <laughs> um, so, you know, I think there is, there still is a kind of, you know, spiritual, mystical um, connection between the letting of blood and, and um, you know, how, how we feel and identity and, <laughs> Um, right. So there's, I mean, it still is something that, that is, that is used. And I guess I, I, <laughs> I don't want to like connect this to the coronavirus necessarily, but it's, I think there, you know, I said, su I suggest that, you know, bloodletting is kind of a, could be seen in the 18th century as a kind of psychological therapy, um, even if it doesn't work, and even if it is potentially harmful, it maybe made people feel better. Um, but I think there's, that's a troubling way to look at it as well, in terms of, you know, if you think of practices that linger, that, that, that people cling on to psychologically that don't actually do any good, um, I don't know, like washing your groceries at the beginning of <laughs> which we now know or like plexiglass all over the place or quarantining books and all of these things um like those are things we know we should let go of but that are being clung to and i mean those seem like sort of you know i guess uh mundane or innocuous things but i don't know like i think i do <laughs> science is important too right so I'm rambling on, but I, I didn't mean to suggest that bloodletting was good in the 18th century just because it made people feel better. I'm, I'm just sort of exploring the different the different sides of that of that debate. <laughs> Absolutely, and then that sort of exploration is so needed. I mean, I'm looking at the chat here, and I've got a couple of mentions of um, Hunter, and and just thinking about the science that's behind that, um, the idea of spirits spirit or essence in the blood, as Lisa Ram points out, makes me think about the number of different groups who interacted with bloodletting and, and how we may never get a unified narrative of what bloodletting meant to everyone in the 18th century. I think, I think there's probably some almost wonderfully conflicting views as well as ones that, that, that matched. Um, I can see Dahlia's hand up. I'm going to go to her. Well, we might want to continue this conversation first because I think Chris had a really interesting suggestion about bloodletting. He brought up Susan Juster's work on mystical pregnancy and holy bleeding. And I think that's a really interesting connection. So Chris's like thing in the chat, I think super important for the topic that we're talking about right now that Heather, that's around Heather's paper. So if we want to keep talking about that, I'll save my question for later. Absolutely. So I will scroll back up through the chat um, and capture a few bits on bloodletting here. So Dahlia is referring to the comment by Chris here 
Um, on the matter of bloodletting and gender, I'm thinking about a Susan just as mystical pregnancy and holy bleeding, visionary experience in early modern Britain and America, in which she describes how the intense physicality of female piety was often expressed in ecstatic nosebleeds and weepings, periodic stigmatic bleedings, mystical lactations and other such phenomena indicative of the extreme porousness of women's bodies. And that is an interesting thought. The question here is, I wonder what sorts of threads might connect the medical practice of phlebotomy from this sort of spontaneous phlebotomy as a symptom of religious experience in women specifically. I, I, I guess I can attempt to, I don't know if, if Chris would like to say anything further um, and sort of to flesh out that idea. But when I think of that, I also, I mean, I, I I'm sort of exploring this idea as I speak, but but I, I you know the 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 spontaneity of of those religious expressions um, versus sort of the controlled and disciplined practice of phlebotomy. I think um, that that's an interesting contrast to be to be explored. I was there was I noticed earlier in the chat, and I maybe I'll try to relate. I, I can't remember who it was. Right, the the first person who put a question in Miriam Wallace um, ask, sort of looking at the notion of invasive medicine as masculinized versus non-invasive care as feminized. It's in, in a way that sort of, the, both of those questions sort of set in opposition, the male and the female. And it, it's funny, I feel like I, I I feel like as I as I work more on the the, the literature of and and the medicine of the 18th century, um, those separations are just constantly to me being problematized in so many different ways just through the work that I read and and I, I you know the, the 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 medical the the physicians' methods and the ways that they express themselves in their medical texts are often oftentimes so hesitant and humble. And there's a willingness. I mean, sometimes they're really violent in the ways they express themselves, but there is this sort of expression of humility, um, a willingness to challenge one's own, uh, you know, one's assumptions and to go back and correct what they did before or to express you know, complete ignorance um, um, with regards to certain issues. And I think, so I think there's like, I think the 18th century is an interesting moment in that respect too, where I don't think setting the, like, you know, this notion of the leaky female body in opposition to the, like the controlled male physician's methods necessarily always works very well. Um, and and so, and and you have like a lot of these women asking to be, to be um, phlebotomized, too. <laughs> like um, so, Piazzi wanted it. There's another woman, Elizabeth Freak, who was repeatedly asking to have blood let. And Lady Mary Wortley Montague, for instance, in one journal entry, she says that she she agreed to 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 bloodletting after a long contestation. But she, the very fact that she says she agreed to it suggests that there is. There's some, like the, a lot of these women had a lot of power in the ways that they're, uh, uh, the ways that these, um, you know, practices were exerted upon them. And I think someone like Wayne Wilde has written, you know, written about this at length already, the, the, the sort of, the, how, how much say that the patient actually had in, in their treatment over the course of this period. So that's a very indirect answer to Chris's question, but but I was sort of trying to answer the other question at the same time. And I, and I do think that that's sort of troubling this, this separation between invasive male medicine and non-invasive female care doesn't quite work. Like those, that, that, that <laughs> opposition gets turned on its head repeatedly. Um, the, the more I read of medical texts, the more I see this. So a lot of my early, the earlier work I've published, I read it, I'm like, no, that's, I don't believe that anymore, actually. <laughs> There's, it's the wonderful thing about scholarship, right? But, but it's, um, you know, I do think that there's a lot of work to be done in troubling those divisions. 
Absolutely, Heather. And across these three papers, I'm beginning to see so many dynamics of gender and power, both independently and together. And I'm just trying to think of this holistically because there's a lot changing my mind already. I do want to come back to Dahlia in the interest of um, not letting the conversation escape. Was your question for Daisy uh, or Clark, Dahlia? It was. It's actually just a, a quick question that might be perhaps Daisy and Clark could uh, both come in on. So I'm interested in um, what the Writing Doctors Project has um, discovered about translation. And one of the reasons I'm interested in this is, um, so I don't know if Daisy has come across this, but I've seen a number of case of instances where case histories from dispensaries and infirmaries have been translated um, from German into English, English into German, English into Italian. So between different um, languages, not Latin. And so I'm, I'm interested, so that's a one question, like kind of a, a small question is, is, does this idea of translation figure into the things that you're seeing in print, Daisy? Um, and larger question for Clark and the project more generally is what is the role of translation between different languages for the, the question of like the transformation from Latin into English vernacular writing. Shall I go first? Um, not a great deal in terms of translation. I mean, the, the works are certainly are translated into uh, German, a lot of Andrew Duncan's work, including the case notes, were translated into German, but he didn't really have anything to do with that, that he viewed that as something very separate and in fact something he wasn't terribly happy about because he didn't make any money out of it. Um, in terms of other aspects of language, one that comes up quite frequently in the case notes is in relation to Scots. Um, Andrew Duncan and the other physicians will regularly bemoan the fact that any um, Highlanders who had come down to live in Edinburgh were incomprehensible and he, they were very um, rude and, and offensive towards the Highlanders and their sort of um, what he viewed as a more primitive state. So in terms of his personal focus, the only one that really comes up is Scots. Um, but yeah, he wasn't happy about the translations into German, but they were very much something that was separate from his work in the way that he viewed it. I don't know about the wider project, though. I'm hoping Clark <laughs> can help me with that. Yeah. Um, well, the, the, <laughs> if you if you'd have asked me this in a year's time, I'd have had a better answer for you. Actually, <laughs> um, no, it's a good it's a very good question, actually. But um, we the situation at the moment is we we've got um, three uh, well uh, more project publications than that, but we're the three that are in development for with the papers to be submitted in a pretty much a year's time. Uh, the pandemic has ridden the coach and horses through some of our original deadlines because of the people can't get into uh, archives and libraries and things like that. So we've, we've got in some of these publications, we've got people working on uh, uh, continental literature, continental medicine, um, Euro European continental. Also, well, Alan's done a bit on American as well, but uh, that required significantly less to no translation, I would say, for, for Alan's work. Um, so, so I can't say anything very definitive about the, uh, about the, the larger picture yet, because I'd, I'd rather see, because the, the expertise is outside of our immediate team, unless any of our team wants to chip in and say something about this. So, uh, so I'm kind of waiting to hear uh, on, on that. Um, but I, I, I would say, um, that some very interesting points have already been raised um, in the chat, if nowhere else, uh, right at the start. Uh, ooh, where are we going? Sorry, I'm just finding this before I lose it. Uh, for Miriam uh, saying about, does the move from Latin both open to wider Anglophone readers debate, but also perhaps limit access to non-English speakers and Latin is still handy for say cross national bird watching, which is a, a really good point actually. In, in, in what way is the, the shift to English actually closing down a European wide um, or, or a discussion about uh, or, or a possibility for uh, a certain readership, um, a certain accessibility in, in different vernaculars. Um, and the answer to that is, I don't know, I could make some guesses, um, but I, I, I'd rather let our, our um, Europeanists uh, and experts in other languages 
say a little bit more about that rather than me. I mean, Roberta might have some thoughts on this, actually, um, at least in the French context, if nothing else. But uh, I, I'm throwing you right in there, Roberta, but it's not what you're working on, I know, but I, I, you, you, you do have a sort of special interest in the, the French side of things as well. Um, so, so I'm giving you kind of no answer at all, <laughs> really, for the time being. But I say watch this space and, and give, us, give us a couple of years uh, to come back to you on that one, where, where be people with better minds than my own will we'll, we'll give, give us more information on that. But if any member of the team wants to say something that I'm missing, and I probably am, then please do chip in. No, it's I... really, oh, sorry, go ahead, Ashley. Sorry, was I, I can't see hands for a second, um, but by all means talk in front of me there. Just bouncing off Clark's uh, comments, sorry, it's Roberta. Uh, I just noted in the chat that there definitely does seem to be quite a lot of dialogue between English and French uh, physicians in the in the early mid 19th century that they're reading each other's work, that they're able to, uh, in particular that the English can read the French. I think the French are much more likely to ignore English writing than vice versa, <laughs> which is interesting, um, uh, but, but that's one example. Mm. Yeah. I mean, I suppose it's just a general comment that we, we can make that, that obviously medicine is a, a, um, a, an international phenomenon in the 18th century, but uh, although Latin is the lingua franca in, in Europe, just my own reading, you know, tells me that, that uh, uh, um, physicians very often were multilingual and they, they couldn't understand perfectly well what was going on. And things got translated pretty quickly, actually, if it, they were deemed to be uh, at all, uh, at least fashionable, if not significant. Um, so, uh, bouncing back to fashionable diseases, one of our previous projects. So, um, so, so yeah, that's the very, the very least one can say is, is that actually I think translation is pretty fluid and, and rapid, um, and that uh, that things um, uh, are turned into English from various European languages pretty quickly. Um, so, uh, it's it's a kind of fast moving print environment, um, and, and and the transmission of medical knowledge. Uh, is 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 uh, is certainly European. Sorry, I'm gone. It's all right. I, I was attracting Ashley's attention um, <laughs> because I, I have another question, that, yeah, sort of linked question for Daisy. Um, uh, well, I must say, in, in in parentheses, I enjoyed your paper very much, Heather, and it's very nice to see you again. Um, you. But uh, Daisy, this is a very simple question, actually. Um, has Latin disappeared entirely from the texts you've been talking about, apart from, you know, being used to name medications and so on? Um, mostly there are occasional quotes which are unsurprisingly not in the handwritten case notes, but when they are, are right. made into print versions, those, the English words are Latinized. Um, so I think it, it is, you know, it, it's performative is the feeling that I get, yes. um, but yeah. it's not necessarily useful, but it is a way of obviously displaying their intellect, whereas their personal notes for their own reference. Um, there is no Latin other than specific, as you say, treatments or medical terms. Mm -hmm. That is so interesting. The, I mean, I didn't expect that answer, actually. Um, I've been working on Swift's satires on, on, on medics, um, and he makes a lot of the performative aspect of Latin, um, even if they're using it wrongly, um, they like to use it um, because it makes them, it gives them status, um, even if it's nonsense, you know. So there's an interesting link there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alan. Um, I'm getting a little bit of feedback on my microphone. Apologies not to be able to take all of the questions in the chat because I think we are growing this conversation so very beautifully and I want to give the other speakers this afternoon a little bit of room as well to maybe make some links with what we're talking about. Um, so if we could take a, a five minute comfort break if anyone needs to stretch their legs and we'll come back with Michelle chairing the second panel. Thank you very much for, for your enthusiasm today. So, so to begin with, welcome everyone. Welcome back everyone. Uh, just if you're, if you're coming back to us now. And I'd like to introduce Bryn Jones Square who did her PhD at, at Oxford and the title of her paper is A Matter of the Soul, Erasmus Darwin, Mary Shelley and the Mind-Body Problem. So please take it away, Bryn. 
Hi there. Again, I've just loved the paper so far. And thank you, Michelle, everyone. This is a total blast. I'm shaking with excitement, sweating a little bit too. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so I'll just get started. Mine's changed a little bit um, since I proposed it because I tend to get way too many ideas <laughs> at once. But uh, this is, okay, we'll start. I'm just going to start from the slide and then I'll yak and yak. Uh, doop -ba -doop -boo. Here we go. So this here. Thanks for your patience and begin. All right. So Michelle just gave you the title and uh, that's me there. If you didn't notice, um, I just included my contact information just because uh, in case you want to get in touch, I would love to just um, collaborate with everyone. I think it's that's so important right now. We're talking about interdisciplinarity and it really shows us um, how necessary it is right now, especially with the climate crisis and the pandemic to combine literature and the sciences. The sciences can give us facts, right? We get the facts from science. And then literature allows us to sort of consider the consequences of those facts, right? So Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is exactly that. We have this like male um, mindset where Victor Frankenstein um, uses nature. So I, Humphrey Davy, you know, also has that idea that we master nature. I know you know that, Sharon. Um, and uh, so that idea is what the, what has brought about climate change too, right? We think that the, the earth is just something we can use to get ahead and to improve and to progress. And so it's sort of turned into this psychopathic mindset where instead of having compassion for the other, for the earth. Instead, the, the focus is just getting ahead, competition, and without thought or regard for the other. So <laughs> that's bringing into my idea that um, interdisciplinary is so important and the romantic era is so important because the romantic um, sort of values of togetherness and connection and interconnection and connection with the natural world. That's what we need to do right now. That's the indigenous worldview, traditional worldview, that idea of pantheism um, and words worse idea of, I've started talking so much. I have slides for this. So I'm actually gonna move to the next one. I'm just so excited to talk to you guys. Um, so I had all of this, but I'll, I'll start with this. So yeah, the romantic worldview, right? And the indigenous worldview, um, the idea that as William Wordsworth says in his uh, Tintured Abbey, this sort of divinity that rolls through and connects all things. And um, what's really interesting is that pantheistic worldview, there are new theories of um, consciousness now. Uh, so Philip Goth is a really amazing um, cognitive scientist. And he has this theory of panpsychism that everything in the world is conscious, right? So um, the trees are conscious, the rock is conscious, and we're all sort of connected by this vital energy. So we've been talking a lot about that, whether that is divinity or soul or spirit or um, it could even be many of uh, recently, there's a neuro economist who's suggested that what will uh, what Adam Smith, Mary Shelley, David Hume refer to as sympathy, um, oxytocin may be the chemical signature for that because when we connect with others and mirror each other's behavior, um, we literally can move each other and change each other. We change our physiology. There's an amazing neuroscientist um, who talks about how just saying a single word, sending someone a text can literally change someone's physiology and immune system, hence the importance of poetry and literature. But I'm getting ahead of myself. So again, all of these romantic worldviews are so important right now, um, especially when we're, we're being reminded of how deeply connected we are to our planet, that our psyche is connected to the Earth's psyche, that what we do the planet is going to harm our own psyches, hence the rise of uh, mental illness. Um, uh, I don't know if you know A. Elbrecht, but he has a, a book called Earth Emotions. And he talks about the rise of eco-anxiety, eco-grief, nature deficit disorder, um, a term he refers to as solastalgia. Um, so the connection of solace and nostalgia, which is such a key term in the Romantic era with uh, William and Dorothy Wordsworth um, having to leave their homeland and what that does to you psychologically. Um, so again, all connected to health and medicine um, and everything else. So this idea of this sort of interconnected universe that is mimicked at every level, just even in our human interactions. Um, so again, romanticism is pretty great. Um, I was also talking about, um, I wanted to bring in the idea that like evolution <laughs> and uh, plays into this so much too. So uh, Charles Darwin um, talks about how we can only flourish as a species if we learn to extend our sympathy to all sentient beings. 
that also comes into play in Buddhism. Um, compassion identification with living things is essential to our existence. Um, Erasmus Darwin <laughs> argues, so important influence for Mary Shelley, obviously. Michelle Faubert talks about um, Erasmus so brilliantly in her book, Rhyming Reason. So thank you, I'll quote you later. <laughs> um, but yeah, Erasmus Darwin too, right? This idea that um, we need to live in harmony with the natural world because we are connected to it. I'm going to go back to a few slides because I got way too excited. No, I think I'm good actually. Okay, I'll skip those. I just put a bunch of words on slides. This is going back to, okay, so we were talking about how there's the indigenous, um, traditional, um, pantheistic view of nature that we're hoping to return to where we are connected to the natural world. So it's this hyper empathic, like deeply um, sort of aware, a deep awareness of how we are linked to um, systems and the systems of nature. So, but then again, we have the psychopathic sort of um, medical personality, which is so again, based on the idea of mastering nature. So it just, it's all the same things that would define a psychopath is also how we're treating nature. So we master nature versus being stewards of nature. Um, we're trying to modify and alter the natural world rather, rather than living in unison and harmony in you know in sync with it um there's no empathy again so that it's that individualistic mindset that's so that arose in you know the romantic era too this and it was so important too this idea of individuality and it brought about revolution and change but at the same time what it does is it um sort of makes us more and more self-focused and then we lose that ability to connect and see beyond ourselves. So romanticism teaches you that in so many ways, uh, particularly through the romantic idea of, of the imagination, right? And so that's why Wordsworth and Erasmus Darwin and Mary Shelley all talk about the power of poetry and imagination because what it does is it exercises our imaginations and allows us to take different perspectives. Can you tell I'm excited? I'm getting way ahead of myself here. Um, and so what I wanted to bring in too, so if we're talking about um, the connections between speech and poetry and reading um, and the idea of synchronizing with the natural world and getting in sync with it, um, there's also a really key part, which you all know of Frankenstein is the idea of listening and hearing. Um, so they're at one point, as you all know, Victor, uh, the creature covers Victor Frankenstein's eyes and just says, listen to me, hear me without the fatal prejudice, right? And so again, um, our, our senses and particularly our sight can really get in the way when we're trying to empathize with another, um, which is why imagination is so important too, right? Because you can sort of think beyond what you're seeing. But Ursula Gwynne argues that speech connects us so immediately and vitally because it's a physical bodily process. So if you mount two clocks the other side by side, they're actually going to begin to swing together eventually. And this actually happens with humans. So my voice, the sound waves right now are affecting your brains. So we're literally connected this way, um, which is very cool. <laughs> and so uh, William Condon actually says, communication is like a dance with everyone engaged in intricate shared movements across many subtle dimensions. Listening is not a reaction, but it's actually connection. So it's a converse, or sorry, it's a conversation or a story, but we don't so much respond to as it as we become part of the action. So again, it's this idea of deep listening and it's all connected again to empathy, our ability to really hear um, and recognize the other because our ability to do that and to confer and or sort of acknowledge another's identity is how that person is going to actually um, feel whole and, and feel loved as a human being. So I'm gonna skip this, but this is all about the vibrations and frequencies um, that happen and that allow us to connect to the natural world. So talking about sound, um, sound itself is just vibrations of molecules and the intensity of that vibration, uh, which is bringing me to also the idea of music in romanticism and the alien harp, um, which are so key too. And this, this idea that um, the divinity can play upon us and that that's actually going to allow us to change the world. But I'm going to get to my main, here we go. This is actually where it starts. So this is bringing it back. So I'm moving right into the idea of interconnection, interdependence. So um, as we know, the universe is founded upon connection, interdependence. And this notion is so powerfully and pervasively and prophetically um, shown in Mary Shelley's writings and also through Erasmus Darwin, who was an important influence. Um, as Lord May, uh, Raymond argues in The Last Man, philosophers have called man a microcosm of nature and find a reflection in the internal mind 
for all this machinery visibly at work around us. So again, that machinery, so the invisible, whether again, it's the oxytocin or it's the spirit, whatever is like that invisible fiber or thread or vibration that's connecting all of us. Um, in ecological criticism, Krober says that the individuality of an organism is not definable except through its interactions with its environment, through its interdependencies. Um, so again, this is what romantic literature is showing us and Mary Shelley throughout her writings like The Last Man, uh, which is so obviously relevant right now where a plague destroys humanity and this plague is nature turning against humanity. Again, it's within that psychopathic mindset where we use the, in that period using nature and um, the industrial revolution. And so she, the nature becomes this like the image of a plague and of nature itself. Um, destroying humanity because of that lack of respect. So she's just so ahead of her time and so brilliant. Um, and so this internal working um, of the world around us. Um, so the fractals in the human body are actually an echo of those in nature. I'm talking about this because it shows, again, just that web of life and, and how we're just so connected to everything. Um, I love uh, Satish Kumar. He argues that we are all connected to each other and breathe the same air and drink the same water. There a shared universal consciousness. You are made of the earth, air, fire, water, and consciousness. The same with all the universe, the trees, the mountains. We are all made of these elements. Once again, what Wordsworth and Mary Shelley and all of those wonderful, wonderful radical people were saying so long ago. I'll keep moving. I got a little obsessed here. This is the idea that our brains are fractals, um, but I'm going to move into my part, this is all about the movement of emotion. Okay, so we're talking to you about uh, romantic romanticism and consciousness. So if we think it brings me back to uh, Genesis. So Mary Shelley's Frankenstein is actually kind of like an expedited version of evolution. And so I sort of look at it and then there's um, Erasmus Darwin's The Temple of Nature. And so these are looking at forms of evolution and examining it from a literary perspective. So we, we have like the science and then this evolutionary science is turned into something that is more accessible through the literary form. And so we can, we can absorb it better. Our brain responds better to metaphors than it does to just um, straight language. Um, so this is in um, Genesis, the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters and commanded, let there be light. The stillness was disturbed. The water set in eternal motion and the darkness was made dazzlingly bright. Um, so like the wind suddenly perpetually, sorry, perpetually cresting waves in a motionless and soundless sea. So the big bang is said to have created cosmic ripples, ever expanding waves swelling outwards. So this is bringing in Frankenstein now. So one of my favorite neuroscientists, also Michelle, let me know if I go over it all, just shut me off because I have way too long going on here. But um, analogy to the awakening of consciousness um, to throwing a stone in a pool of water. So you throw a stone and as you see in the photo, they're just these ever expanding ripples. So this is really similar to the big bang. So there's this singularity and then um, bang. And then all of a sudden you have constant ripples in time expanding outwards. So what I have done is compared that to Mary Shelley's Frankenstein and the idea that like the kernel of the narrative, so you have the center and then you have these concentric rings going outwards, 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 ever expanding. So this idea that um, the story itself is like a metaphorical stone being thrown in a pool of water. And so we have the center of the narrative and then we have the creature telling his story to Victor Frankenstein, Victor Frankenstein telling it to Robert Walton, Robert Walton telling it to his sister. And then we have the outside reader and then we have like continuing iterations of it. So it's if, as if this like novel that is about the science of consciousness um, and the philosophy of consciousness rippling through time infinitely now, right? Which is just so beautiful and it shows, just shows how powerful literature can be. Um, so I argue that Frankenstein is a study of the science of consciousness or the soul and what it means to be alive and exist among others. Um, so these kind of questions come up in Frankenstein. Our bodies are animated, is what animates them itself some kind of physical body? Or is it something of an entirely different kind? So again, um, is our soul united to our body? Is it generated by the brain? Is our consciousness generated by the brain? Or is it um, part of some larger universal consciousness, which is really connected to the idea of pantheism that was so important? Again, that our brains are connected to everything, which is connected to the divine. 
Um, and again, uh, let's see Brynn, what else. Bryn, if I can just break in here, yeah. maybe you could wrap it up uh, yeah. in say about a minute or so. Easily, easily. Okay, <laughs> sounds great. Yeah, sorry, sorry, to, sorry to interrupt. I want you to. I'm I have like it. one slides. I just have too much to say. Um, so yeah, great. so that um, the soul and what is consciousness, and um, yeah, quickly. There's a Darwin. I'll see if I can fit in synesthesia so there's synesthesia <laughs> in frankenstein so the creature so synesthesia is the blending of senses so um people who can see music right so in and when we're born we are um it's thought that we all have synesthesia so our brains are hyper connected all these different connections um as we grow older there's this pruning process but when we're but born that's what it is and so this is my sort of argument that this is a story of evolution because when the creature is born it says with considerable difficulty that i remember at the original era of my being the events were confused and distinct and then he says a multiplicity of sensation sees me so it's as if he has synesthesia which when we you can actually develop it when you're older through metaphor and empathy and poetry and therefore if we read her work we become more um, empathetic and I've done it I think <laughs> sorry that was so rushed <laughs> no that was that was just great thank you it's exciting it's so exciting <laughs> there's so many wonderful ideas here and I just wish yes big big claps that's great thanks thanks you're Brent. welcome only I, I, I trust we'll have time to talk about um, some of these wonderful ideas. Thank you so much for your your great discussion. And uh, I'm yeah, I'm just bursting with ideas now because of your great ideas. So thanks, thanks again. That's wonderful. Um, so we'll go next to Beth, um, Beth Brigham from Northumbria University, uh, and the title of her paper is "Is it not enough to have our bodies to practice on when living and to dissect when dead?" Uh, Frankenstein, bioethics, and romantic healthcare, so closely connected, and I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing uh, Beth's paper. Please, Beth, take it away. Sorry, just had to unmute myself there. <laughs> um, okay. So yeah, I am probably a little bit of an unfamiliar face to many of you here, um, but I, as Michelle says, I am a PGI at Northumbria University, um, supervised by Lee Weatherall Dixon. Um, and while not attached to the Writing Doctors Project, um, my work kind of has a lot of um, alignments with, that, with the project. So any opportunity to kind of contribute and collaborate is always very much welcome. Um, so thanks for having me today. Um, yeah, Bryn, I think, and Daisy's paper actually have set me up quite nicely for mine, so I'm going to get going. Um, so today, really, I want to talk about Mary, uh, Mary Shelley's Frankenstein as a kind of bioethical framework, a cultural touchstone through which to engage with and assess the ethical status of romantic healthcare, obviously in line with the theme of today's event. And I think really the first thing I should probably do is explain what I'm talking about when I say bioethics. So um, I have a few definitions up here on the slide, and I think really the best explanation comes from Rebecca McWhorter, who describes bioethics as the ethical considerations of health professionals and researchers as applied within healthcare delivery, health policy and biological and medical research. And really the term bioethics was coined in 1970. In response to rising public awareness of serious lapses in the treatment of medical research subjects and dramatic advances in genetic engineering. The American biochemist Van Rensselaer Potter II, which is quite a name to pronounce, stated that um, bioethics brought together two vital components, biological knowledge and human values. And I think really this is important in terms of Frankenstein as a very recent special issue of the Huntington Library Quarterly, um, in, in which um, Gerald E. Hogel, Alan Buell, Robert Mitchell and Anne K. Meller all discussed Frankenstein's enduring relevance in relation to modern bioethical concerns. Um, so really bioeth bioethics is significant as a discipline developed collaboratively between scientists, social scientists and philosophers. And I really think that literature has a place within this growing field. And as does McWhorter, who suggests that a multidisciplinary approach is crucial for provoking high quality and relevant bioethical debates informed by a greater understanding of the past. And that's really what I'm looking to show here when I'm bringing in kind of Frankenstein, bioethics and romantic healthcare alongside one another. 
In turn, bioethical considerations actually offer us a way to reconsider Frankenstein's cultural value. As Robert Mitchell's noted, Frankenstein is less a cautionary tale about the sciences than a literary technology that enables us to think through the relationship of regulation and self-regulation to sciences, the state, populations, and individual differences in the context of a globally connected world. So where am I in all of this? Uh, well, Alan Buell names um, Frankenstein as the first major literary work to take up the question of bioethics. But he also suggests that readers are today in a better position to understand the bioethical dimensions of the novel than were Mary Shelley's contemporaries. And I think this seems to be the general view. When considering Frankenstein's bioethics, we consider ethical concerns surrounding modern day advances in biology and medicine. Yet early ethical codes have been acknowledged. Um, such as those offered by John Gregory, who published his lectures on the duties and qualifications of a physician in 1772, and Thomas Percival, whose medical ethics first appeared in pamphlet form in 1794. Um, and also parallels have been drawn between bioethics and kind of the late 19th century. For example, Roy and Dorothy Porter suggested that concerns about compulsory smallpox vaccinations brought up issues within institutions and wider public discourses about individual liberty, informed consent and community welfare. So really I wanna build on this narrative by suggesting that Frankenstein is in fact evidence that bioethical concerns were being raised long before the term was coined. Ethical debates um, about medical scientific research and experimentation were certainly taking place within the Romantic period. Um, oh yeah. Okay, so this anonymous pamphlet from 1825, I think, is really evidence of this point. Um, as the monster and array of allegations, it raises some interesting issues about romantic healthcare. So it says, now, although we are deeply sensible of the importance and value of the medical profession and the necessity of affording every means for its cultivation and advancement, we entertain strong doubts about whether the, the governors of St. Thomas's Hospital are justified either legally or morally in sanctioning such an application of the funds of the institution of which they are appointed guardians? Is it not enough that you have our bodies to practice on when living and to dissect when dead? Must we, in addition to this, pay for the erection of theatres and dissecting rooms where our remains are to be mutilated and exhibited for your instruction and improvement? So the author here is suggesting that funds were being taken from the poor who wanted to enter charitable hospitals where they were then subjected to experimental treatments which would then be offered to more private well-off patients if they actually worked. Also, if the patients were to die in the hospitals, they were dissected often against their express wishes for the purposes of medical research. And then to top it all off, we've got the funds going towards building new anatomical theatres and dissection rooms. Um, and I really think this is significant as while the need for research and medical advancement is acknowledged within this discussion about funds, the author also raises questions about the legal and also moral limits of medical practice within healthcare settings. And actually similar points have been raised about medical research in hospitals for a long time. Um, significantly, Mary Wollstonecraft engages with this issue in Mariah or the wrongs of woman, so a text she wrote in 1797. Um, in this text, Jemima, who's, Marie, is, who's Mariah's jailer when she's locked in the private asylum, tells us her tragic story, which involves being forced to go into a hospital. And she says, I cannot give you an adequate description of the wretchedness of a hospital. Everything is left to the care of people intent on gain. The attendants seem to have lost all feeling of compassion in the bustling discharges of their offices. Death is so familiar to them that they are not anxious to ward it off. Everything appeared to be conducted to the accommodation of the medical men and their pupils who came to make experiments on the poor for the benefit of the rich. And I think this is pertinent as Wollstonecraft um, was ethically engaging with this point, especially as Mary Shelley, in fact, read this text twice, um, at least once in 1814 and 1822. And so there are obvious crossovers here with, um, with the portrayal of Victor Frankenstein, who obviously loses sight of his domestic affections as he focuses on his scientific ambitions. Um, and his transgressive experimentation where life and death simply appear ideal bounds. Um, and Wollstonecraft's literary count also directly corresponds with the pamphlet. Um, both note that patients were required to pay three shillings and sixpence to enter a hospital with a down payment of a guinea to cover any potential burial costs. Um, here on the slide, you can see that the Millard account actually suggests that these deposit is Deposits were pocketed by the hospital porters who would send deceased patients to dissecting theatres and actually even perform mock funerals for the relatives. 
And I think this, this process raises an abundance of ethical issues, but particularly those about the level of healthcare within hospitals, as the medical perfection were actually potentially gained more if lucratively and in terms of research potential, if the patients were to die. And this seems to fit with a more con general contemporary perception of the medical profession as being more concerned with experimenting on the poor than actually treating them. For example, in Wollstonecraft's Mariah, Jemima claims she was dismissed before her queue was completed. And, it's then, and she's then turned out onto the streets where she goes into a cycle of crime and poverty. So um, Wollstonecraft's quite accurate information is perhaps unsurprising when we consider that while writing Mariah, she had quite a reasonably close relationship with Anthony Carlisle, a surgeon from Westminster Hospital that I've already spent quite a lot of time researching. Um, Robert Southey, who was also an acquaintance of Carlisle, in correspondence from 1797 actually suggests that he and Carlisle were planning to aid the poor by establishing a convalescent asylum, which he states was intended to receive persons who are sent from the hospitals as the immediate return to unwholesome air, bad diet and all the lawsomeness of poverty destroys a very great number. And this scheme was, according to Southey, prompted after finding a poor woman almost dying for want. He was now rapidly recovering um, in the hospital under Carlisle. So quite a similar anecdote to the one provided in Mariah. Uh, many la years later, at the Select Committee on Education of 1834, Carlisle would actually state that no anatomy school should be attached to a hospital because it had a bad effect on the minds of the patients. And he claimed he personally would not operate on a patient who labored under any apprehension that if they died, they'd be dissected. He states that it must create a great deal of horror, which I think is a wholesome superstition and a safeguard to the living. And I think that idea of kind of safeguarding vulnerable patients and research subjects is a kind of recognizable bioethical, bioethical consideration. So finally, to come to Frankenstein, um, the definitive class divide within romantic healthcare is pertinent as Victor himself notes that the dissecting room and the slaughterhouse furnish many of my materials. And so his monster, of course, would be made up of the bodies most readily available and those of the poor certainly some of which would have come from hospitals. And I think that term slaughterhouse is actually is particularly noteworthy as well as the Millard account um, accuses the medical profession of treating the poor like sheep and oxen. So in Frankenstein, actually, I think Shelley shows us that bioethical considerations of today are actually those of yesterday, particularly as Victor tells Walton, if the study to which you apply yourself has a tendency to weaken your affections, and to destroy your taste for those simple pleasures in which no alloy can possibly mix, then that study is certainly unlawful. That is to say, not befitting the human mind. So Shelley provides us with this kind of universal cultural barometer, a way to assess the appropriate limits of research and experimentation, a framework through which to assess the moment when medical scientific ambitions supersede the application of human values. Frankenstein then, does have a place in bioethical debates, not only of the present day, but also of the 19th century. Whereas the accounts of Wollstonecraft and the pamphlet, the legal and indeed moral limits of romantic healthcare were still being negotiated. And that is me, I can get out of this. Thank you very much. That was, that was also just great, Beth. Um, and what a, what a wonderful slideshow you had for us too. Yes, that's me. I see we're all clapping. This is so exciting. Um, I'm sorry, the, the first garbage truck is going by right now. So I'll just let that happen. Okay, I think it's gone. Uh, so, and I want to uh, just take a minute to thank all of you. You no doubt noticed that we're a little over time, but you know, hey, that's we're scholars, so it's hard to sh shut us off. Um, and I think we were, you know, we started over a little over time and it just got that so much more that way. So I won't keep going over time by talking about how we're over time and I will move instead uh, to introduce uh, Roberta Barker from, um, from Dalhousie University. And the title of Roberta's paper is The Rise and Fall of the Romantic Doctor. So please take it away, Roberta. Thank you so much, Michelle. Thanks, thanks for the invitation to be here today, and especially it's uh, it's a privilege to uh, come after two such rich and fantastic papers and the wonderful papers uh, in the first half. Uh, but particularly that dialogue between the two two ways of looking at Frankenstein was so rich, and I'm excited to have some some conversation about that. Uh, and I'm just going to share my screen. 
with my slightly modified title. I hope that everyone can see that. Great. Um, so this is, uh, I'm just going to go to, so I've now uh, uh, made this uh, more specifically. Let me see if I can get this to play. There we go. Got it. Uh, the theatrical rise and fall of the romantic doctor. So one of the things that I'll sort of aim to do in my short talk today is bring a little bit of a theatrical uh, standpoint to uh, the discussions that we've been having today and show how the theater was reflecting um, in the romantic uh, period, but also be before that period and after that period on some of these same questions that uh, colleagues on the panel have raised so fantastically already. And I want to begin with a bit of a modest proposal, uh, one that may look very modest indeed, in fact, from outside the discipline of theater history, uh, but that runs counter to some very well established truisms within theater history. And the proposal is this that the Romantic era was the golden age of the theatrical doctor, at least in Britain and France. In Western theater histories, this is an honor that's generally actually been ascribed to the era of realist drama that followed Romanticism. As far back as 1921, Helen Mary Langer declared that Romantic drama idealizing love could find little place for so useful and prosaic a character as the doctor. So only realism could handle doctors basically, right? But I will argue today that far from eschewing the physician's medicalized gaze, which Stanton Garner has seen as a key aspect of realist drama, a lot of now forgotten romantic dramas celebrated that medicalized gaze and in fact kind of helped to give birth to realism. Turning decisively against the satirical tradition that had shaped 18th century theatrical representations of the doctor, British and French romantic theaters established the physician's credentials as a noble and heroic dramatic character. Critiqued and complicated in important ways by realism and naturalism, the romantic doctor, I'll suggest, fell somewhat from his, and it was always in the theater his, at least in the 19th century, pedestal uh, in the later part of the century, but arguably the fall wasn't complete and the legacies of the romantic stage physician are still very much with us in pop culture today. But to understand the theatrical innovations associated with the romantic theatrical physician, it's important for us to recognize how very unheroic the doctor generally appeared on 18th century French and British stages. A very long tradition of medical satire stretching back at least to the Italian Commedia dell'arte uh, shaped both of the, the theaters of both of these nations. I would say that the greatest single dramatic influence on the representation of doctors in French and British theatrical cultures of the long 18th century, with apologies for using that uh, controversial term as Clark has flagged, uh, was arguably Molière's 1673 masterpiece, Le Malade Imaginaire, or The Imaginary Invalid, which spoofed not only the hypochondriacal delusions of its eponymous protagonist, but also the quack physicians and apothecaries with names like Monsieur Pourjean and Monsieur Diafoirus, aka Dr. Diarrhea, who exploit his imaginary ill health. Over the course of the long 18th century, Le Malade Imaginaire spawned hundreds of adaptations, imitations, and related medical satires on the stages of both London and Paris. 18th century theatrical doctors were generally either bumbling idiots or pretentious suits, and almost always quacks. Both sides of the satirical coin are showcased, for example, in Isaac Bickerstaff and Samuel Foote's 1768 London comedy, The Devil Upon Two Sticks in which we find at one end of the scale, the modern physician, Dr. Hercules Hellebore, who uses his microscope to convince his patients that their symptoms of jaundice are caused by tiny yellow flies that have taken up residence in their blood and therefore to feed the patients spider's eggs so that the arachnids can quote, extirpate the race and restore the patient to health. This makes bloodletting look really, really good. On the other end of the medical spectrum and much more, probably much more attractive to Hester Thrale Piazzi, for example, stands the ex-cobbler Emmanuel Last, who relies almost wholly on copious bloodletting and is trusted by his patients, even though his malapropisms constantly expose his lack of education. Faced with a prelate who, as he says, has fallen flat in a fit of perplexity, Last declares, I took out my launcelot and forthwith opened a large artifice in one of the jugglers. In response, the play's young hero declares himself, quote, more afraid of being sick than ever I was in my life. 
Setting up as the mirror and scourge of the medical profession's pretensions then, 18th century British and French stages were little inclined to sympathetic representations of the medical personality. And just to uh, kind of hook into uh, Clark's uh, plug at the beginning, um, if you're interested in hearing more about some of these satirical uh, uh, theatrical versions of the doctor in the 18th century, um, uh, I'm very grateful to have my essay on this, uh, on this subject included in, in the forthcoming volumes that Clark and Andrew have mentioned. The eventual shift away from this satirical tradition is linked to the influence of both vitalist and materialist paradigms in later 18th century medicine, as well as to that of the cult of sensibility upon French and British theatrical cultures. Though often constructed as inimical to one another, both vitalist and materialist or anatomically focused models of medicine constructed the physician as a delver into the recondite secrets of the human body. Doctors trained at the intersection of these paradigms, as many were, for example, in the famed schools of Paris around the turn of the 19th century, tended to read the pathologies visible in diseased organs as reflecting the workings of inward passions or of related processes that fueled or threatened the vital principle. As sentimental drama and theories of acting grew ever more focused upon the actor's apparently spontaneous revelation of human emotion, the theatrical audience was encouraged doctor-like to scour the signs and symptoms offered by the actor's body on stage for the complex hidden feelings they might convey. Because doctors sought to read the emotions by tracing those emotions effects upon the body, they offered ideal exemplars for the sentimental spectator in the theater. And perhaps this is one of the reasons that we find heroic doctor figures emerging quite frequently on the romantic stages of both Britain and France in the early decades of the 19th century. One fascinating example is offered by the Spanish physician Juan de Creda in Joanna Bailey's 1828 play, The Bride, which was intended for performance in Sri Lanka, known to Bailey as Ceylon. Aiming to edify and educate Sri Lankan citizens, Bailey's drama depicts a fierce and nearly fatal conflict between two brothers-in-law, Razinga and Zamarkun, over the possession of the eponymous bride. Bloodshed is only averted when Decreta, who has previously won Razinga's trust by saving his life, is able to convert him to Christianity and thus to forgiveness. Decreta achieves this not only by his own moral rectitude, but also by his diagnostic penetration into Rizinga's inward passions. As you can see in the final speech on this page, uh, where he declares, the misery of thine altered face to me is sight more welcome than a brow composed. So he basically looks at him and says, you look haggard, you look terrible. I can tell that you're suffering. And this means that you're ready to be converted and you're actually ready to come around to a, moral, a more moral position. Similar scenes of face reading occur in Alexandre Dumas Père's 1833 drama Angèle, a play some of you have heard me discuss before in the context of its groundbreaking theatrical representation of consumption. The consumptive in question, Henri Muller, is also a proficient physician who effectively diagnoses the heroine's hidden pain at her seduction by a rake uh, by looking at her pallor. Uh, and in, here's a page from Angèle where you can actually see this happening for those um, who, uh, who read French and, and for those who, who don't. Uh, halfway down the page, we see Henri asks, vous souffrez, are you, are you, are you ill, are you unwell? Uh, Angèle, no, Monsieur Henri, pourquoi cela? No, why do, why do you say that? Uh, and he says, uh, because you've, you've changed color two or three times in the last instant, you know, like you keep, you keep going pale and red, there's something wrong, right? So again, we have this sense that he's reading her emotions by looking at her organism. After delivering her illegitimate child, uh, Henri kills Angèle's seducer and marries her himself, giving the unfortunate baby a name. Thus in Angèle, as in the bride, the romantic stage physician is not only an exposer of physical and emotional truths, but also a bringer of redemption and salvation. He is both the anatomist who uh, exposes moral disease and the vitalist who protects the, immoral, the immortal spark of life within his patients. In both plays, moreover, the romantic physician is also a very white and very male savior. Juan de Creta enters the bride as a European Christian ex machina to resolve the emotional and moral conflicts that Bailey sees as intrinsic to Salonese society. 
Henri Muller exposes Angèle's secrets without regard for her resistance to his medicalized gaze. You note here in this, in this passage, she actually says, no, why are you saying that? And she repeatedly says, please stop looking at me like that. You know, uh, please, like, I don't want to talk about this right now. But he keeps saying, you know, I'm a doctor, I can tell you have a problem. Um, uh, shortly after Angèle's premiere, the Athenaeum complained that Dumas, so here's an example of a British critic talking about a French play, going back to our questions about translation. The Athenaeum complained that Dumas had, quote, degraded the moral question of a struggle against passion and perfidy into a question of midwifery and declared that the physician hero had stolen the, the heroine's agency. The duel, suggested the critic, should have been between the seducer and his mistresses. We did not need the doctor. The Romantic Age itself thus admitted the problematics as well as the potential of its all-seeing, all-saving theatrical doctors. And it was the pr problematic side, I would argue, that came most to the fore as Romanticism transitioned into realism on the later 19th century European stage. In some of the classic plays of the realist canon, such as Chekhov's The Seagull and Ibsen's A Doll's House, doctors remain the sensitive and perceptive confidants who penetrate into the emotional and medical secrets of the bourgeois household. But in many others, things are less rosy. In Chekhov's Ivanov, for example, the doctor is an intrusive and self-righteous meddler who does more harm than good. And within French and British theaters, Realist portraits of doctors often involved overt critiques of modern medicine and its scientific positivism. So this links very much into uh, uh, Beth's uh, paper and, and the, the, the sort of bioethical critique, um, uh, where positivism in these plays was often tied to a lack of emotional intelligence, uh, re reaching back to Brin's paper as well. In François de Curel's 1895 La Nouvelle Idole, The New Idol, for example, a play that I think was quite influenced by Frankenstein, a physician deliberately injects dying patients with cancer cells in order to study the progress of the disease. He finally learns humanity and compassion only from a saintly young nun who is one of his victims. And in George Bernard Shaw's 1906, The Doctor's Dilemma, a brilliant doctor, so such a great doctor that he's able to find the cure for tuberculosis, so lacks emotional understanding of the people around him that he genuinely believes the grieving widow of a patient he has willfully allowed to die will be grateful to him as soon as she realizes that he committed the deed because of her husband's moral failings. In practice, that doesn't turn out to be the case. In such plays, the doctor falls from his romantic heights back into his earlier position as the object of satire and critique. Nevertheless, I would suggest in conclusion, the figure of the romantic doctor continues to haunt Euro-North American cultures of representation. In our own time, the heroic physician is still depicted as an agent of emotional as well as physical insight in popular television shows like House and Grey's Anatomy. Like Juan de Creta and Henri Muller, contemporary stage and screen physicians, and I think House is a fantastic example for watchers of that show, uh, often have their own journeys of emotional turmoil and even of physical illness to undergo alongside their patients. Romantic isolation, passionate intensity, and salvific dedica dedication still appear among physicians' salient characteristics on stage and screen. Perhaps we might say that as long as human societies continue to suffer disillusionment with and resistance to the claims of the medical profession, the ancient tradition of medical satire will likely continue to shape the performing arts. Yet as long as human beings also continue to turn to physicians to expose, understand, and resolve their hidden suffering, the romantic doctor is unlikely completely to die. Thanks very much. That's wonderful. Thank you so much, Roberta. What a, what a great um, end to this wonderful day of papers. And uh, I'm just so excited to uh, have some discussion about these papers now. I'm, um, I'm happy to call on anyone who should want to raise their hands. I can see everyone on my, my screen now. Um, but in the meantime, if you're still generating questions, I can, uh, I thought I would go back to the chat there and I noticed that while both Roberta and Bethany talk about the wholesome superstition. Um, so Roberta, you say the notion of a wholesome superstition seems very productive for thinking about romantic and post romantic responses to medical science and bioethics and um, I'd like to hear more about what your idea of a, um, 
wholesome superstition and perhaps um, Beth, you would, you would chime in there too because you seem to like that idea um, in terms of working on Gothic fiction. Um, so could you, could you start us out please, Roberta, on wholesome superstition and the idea behind that? Sure, I just really loved that quotation yeah. uh, in your presentation, Beth, and I think it, it's so germane to a lot of the discussion across the 19th century about this sort of responses to this rapid, the rapidly burgeoning um, medical, you know, natural philosophy and 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 what comes to be known as medical science. And um, you know, I was thinking, for example, how strongly that quotation connected to some of the the plays that I was thinking about, such as especially La Nouvelle Idole, where it's quite interesting. At the beginning of that play, we actually have like a lot of the uh, uh, the doctors and scientists who are characters in the play, kind of dismissing religion, dismissing the kind of mythology, uh, you know, and, and, and really stressing, you know, if you can't prove it, it's not there. One of them says, has anyone ever seen the soul? It's BS, you know, and uh, it's very much that model of science that Bryn, you know, in your paper, you were, you were uh, showing how, how Shelley combats, right? And uh, uh, interestingly, in that play, um, uh, the, this, it is this young, Catholic novice uh, who is able to kind of embrace death as something that's part of a natural cycle of life and that also can be part of a, of a kind of gift to others um, who, who kind of converts the physician to understanding. Um, uh, and uh, I think that one of the interesting things that critics said about that play at the time was, you know, even if you don't accept her religion, you can accept that actually the message that she is, is sort of, uh, propounding is wholesome for our society, whereas this, this wholesale positivism is not. But, but Beth, I think maybe this hooks so well into your paper that I'm, gonna, I, I'm very interested to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I definitely think it's, uh, it's, it's an interesting quote and not something you would expect maybe a medical professional to say, because usually what I talk about is how um, the medical profession at this time were kind of trying to dismiss superstition because especially to do with, uh, I, mean, I look at the anatomy debates quite a lot. So obviously the, the whole reason that kind of the British public was so against dissection was because it was founded in religious beliefs or what maybe medical professions would perceive as superstition. And um, they believe kind of, you know, however the body went into death was would resurrect that way um, on judgment day. So there was a lot of superstitions that were kind of um, a kind of bar to medical progress in the sense that medical professionals really needed saw it as you know they needed these bodies to kind of work on for anatomy teaching and and to progress in the in knowledge of the body so generally what I would talk about and I have talked about Anthony Carlisle previous to this as well about him kind of dismissing because he was rumored also to be um, an atheist alongside his friends like Godwin and Holcroft um so usually I would I'd see him saying, you know, he's kind of trying to get rid of these superstitions that um, usually I would say like the a lower and middle in class population tend to have. Um, but here later on, he seems to kind of turn that narrative round and maybe change his mind a little bit. And he later discussions, he starts talking about how actually we might have gone a little bit too far with our kind of progress into medical advancement and maybe was actually kind of almost doing like performing dissections for no reason and actually we've kind of reached the limits of our of our knowledge so yeah I think this quote is definitely an outlier in the kind of medical narratives that I tend to look at but and, and like I say I think that does kind of fit into to bioethics because he's starting to think about actually maybe we need to safeguard these patients because were probably maybe taken advantage of, especially because they were poor, they, they were so vulnerable. So the idea of whether actually they were consenting to a lot of the stuff that was happening to them within hospitals is quite, a, you know, it's quite a clear issue in this kind of discussion that I've been having, so. That's wonderful, thanks, thanks Beth. And uh, it's amazing to me how well these papers work together because um, I see this thread kind of running through and speaking just to pick up your point Beth that you just made that this is kind of an outlying idea that this idea of the doctor's respect for the patient's spirituality and uh, religious um, ideas and and that kind of thing because what one thing that I saw kind of carrying through these papers is that um, 
there's this idea of the, well, the quack that you mentioned, Roberto, or the kind of uneducated doctor or the dismissive doctor, or even the, the kind of evil doctor. Uh, and of course, Beth, you, you bring up this idea in terms of, you know, the treatment of the poor and that they were treated, I think you said, um, treated like sheep or oxen, which is just so terrible. Um, but it makes me think of some of the position of anti-vaxxers today, especially now that we're, you know, going through the pandemic. And I've read that one of the things causing the, um, the anti-vaxxer position is a distress for, for doctors. So it seems that this isn't a very, this is a very important aspect of the medical personality. It didn't just start, you know, in the 80s or whatever. It's not a modern thing. So you guys are pointing out really well that this, the medical personality um, must make itself, um, well, you know, amenable to the wider public in order for medicine to go forth well. And, and I, I'm going to link that now with your great paper, Grin, because a lot of what you were talking about is the need for kind of um, sympathy that, that, you know, you're mentioning, for example, that part of what caused the pandemic is our lack of sympathy with the rest of nature that we kind of use nature. Uh, we have used nature as kind of a tool for ourselves. And this is partly what's gotten us into this trouble because of the crossover between diseases and animals and diseases and humans. So um, I wonder, Bryn, if you could speak a little more to, or if you would like to speak a little more to this idea of um, sympathy in terms of the the medical personality, or that is to give kind of a narrower focus to your, your great, um, your kind of universal theory, which I, I think is so important. Um, do, you, do you see that, you know, should, should you be working on doctors first in your, um, your uh, idea that we must kind of recognize our interconnectedness? Yeah, I think it's again just that like interdisciplinarity that's so important is working together, you know, and so there's there's a one side where I'm thinking I have two ideas. So one idea, the idea that the ideal doctor is the natural world. Um, and that's where most romantics find healing. I, I have a paper on Matilda influenced again by Dr. Michelle Fauvert's amazing work, uh, but where I argue that um, the heroine commits a kind of active euthanasia um, when she goes into nature, but it's this like, it's euthanasia, so it's a, it's a good death. Um, and so the idea that, that nature, and it actually does physically cure us, like if we're, oxytocin again is released when we're around trees, when we go outside, um, dopamine's released when we're around beautiful things, beautiful things being in the natural world. So there's one idea of nature as like the ideal healer um, and that we should turn to nature, which we should. But then when you ask too about the, the medical personality, I think it says, it just kind of shows that it needs to be informed by, by literature and the ideas of philosophy and humanity, um, not necessarily, or that, you know, and then again, it's this idea of collaboration, because the more we collaborate, the more ideas we have, the more work we get done. So if you think of interdisciplinarity, like a brain, or like the branches of a tree, or like fungi, um, and like it's, it's um, you know, you have this, say you have this one idea, and then you have the humanities branching out this way and from there you're like oh I can think of this in relation to science and this in relation to this so it's this like constant updating branching um, and there's actually some branchial theory now about like the the theory of everything but um, again our bodies are fractals too and so it's this constant repetition and expansion um, so by working together which is I think what Mary Shelley suggests then we can sort of achieve the the right approach uh, to living in the world. So, and I think that's obviously what the romantics were saying too, like Williams Wordsworth's interest in the psychology of mind and Keats looking at synesthesia, uh, which I'm obsessed with, but I don't want to take up too much time. I just, uh, yeah, I just am so grateful for everything you've all said. And it's just really opened my mind up and uh, there are the branching of neurons for sure. It causes neurogenesis just listening. So thank you so much. Thanks, thanks very much, Bryn, that's, that's great. Um, I think, yeah, one thing that we can kind of say maybe by way of sort of wrapping up um, all of the papers today uh, and just touching on what you just said, Bryn, this idea of interdisciplinarity and especially just to kind of wrap up on the notion of health humanities and how that can affect um, medicine. You know, there have been, uh, there has been a big push for uh, medical students to take health humanities courses. And I think part of that is to address um, some of the issues that uh, Bethany, you point out, and, and Roberta, you point out, this idea that there's a kind of divide 
um, sometimes our distrust of doctors, but that, um, you know, kind of the health humanities brings us all together and speaking the same language and kind of trains in sympathy to, to pull up your idea again, Bryn, you know, that, that idea that Percy Bysshe Shelley brings up in the defense of poetry that, um, you know, sympathy is, is sort of an, a muscle that we have to kind of work out um, through poetry, hey, and uh, that will make us more um, connected and more kind of muscular sympathists, I suppose. Um, so unless there are other questions, um, maybe I'll ask um, Clark and uh, Ashley to kind of chime in and help me uh, along with everyone else, please, to thank our wonderful speakers today. And uh, are, are there things that first, let's just have a round of applause, shall we, for all these wonderful papers. Thank you very much. I've enjoyed it so much. What a, what a great day this has been. And um, I'll, I'll pass it to you, Clark, and then you, Ashley, if you want to say anything in closing. Um. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Michelle. Well, I, I, well, really, I want to thank uh, thank you and Ashley for uh, for for hosting for us and uh, doing such a great job and, and getting such uh, uh, great people together. Um, it's been been a lovely occasion to just see some, as I say, some old friends and to meet some new ones as well. So, uh, so from that point of view, it's it's been a, a total pleasure for me, um, even though I, I'm kind of my presence is is uh, I'm a kind of poor man's Lee. Uh, because uh, our report was uh, so so thoughts to Lee as well. Hope she she feels better very soon uh, uh, for her as well. But uh, no, it's great to see everyone, and you know I just look forward to working with you all uh, um, onwardly in the future. And you know do do keep in contact with us. Um, I can't think of anything else. I'll I'll fire on to Ashley. I I think I can only follow that clock by thanking our uh, our speakers who are doing so much work for our project in other ways as well, and to have such a willing audience when the world is so distracted by these matters of healthcare in, in, in so many other ways. I, one of the things I noted down in that final panel is how much my thoughts come back to contemporary relevance. And um, the first panel discussed, Heather, I think it might've been you who uh, posed the idea of the 18th century is an experimental world for us today. And I think that chimes with the bioethics we've heard of Bryn's very philosophical take on how it is we come to scientific knowledge and what its connection is to the world around us. And I think these are questions we are still asking today. And Roberta, I, I, I've never had a moment that felt like it was so relevant to think about the way that health professionals are portrayed. We are bombarded at the moment by media. And I think if we don't understand the history of medicine, particularly as it appears in literature and print, we have little hope of understanding where our next move should be with public communication. And I think that the long 18th century as we've apologized for so many times and romanticism still has so much to offer and I'm so very overwhelmed by the generosity of scholarly community today, even you know across thousands of miles. So thank you very much. That's just great, Ashley. Thanks, thanks again to all of you. Thanks for the wonderful papers and a great discussion. And oh. Alan's going to say something. <laughs> thank you, I just, Alan. I was just just wanted to say that this has obviously been so absorbing. We've we've even had a feline presence. And yes, that that's is, right. Fantastic. So, so well done, Bryn's cat. Yeah, there he is. <laughs> and um, I just kept beyond that, to add my thanks to everybody, the speakers, um, and Michelle, it was, it was, I think, your idea in the first place. So, so thank, you. thank you very much for that. And, and, um, thanks, Alan. And, and yes, thanks to all of you. I mean, of course, uh, I'm not at all the kind of mother of this um, day because it, it's just been such a joint effort. Uh, um, but it's so great to bring Nasser and writing doctors together. And as you say, Ashley, so many people together, you know, Zoom across the miles, Zoom can be um, good for something. Maybe something good has come out of the pandemic. Um, we can meet more easily now. Um, and uh, Lawrence, thank you. Uh, thanks, everyone. Yes. So I will have this posted to the Nasser uh, YouTube channel. So if you missed anything, or if you want to refresh your memory about something that passed here today, you can see it there. Um, I'll edit it down a little bit for, for uh, say the middle part where we all left, but um, you'll find it pretty much in full there. Um, so I wanna thank you all again.
have a good, great rest of your day and thanks for participating today. Okay, thanks everyone. Thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Take Bye. care, everyone. Bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs>